Hi, and welcome to Lecture 3 of Section 1, where I will be providing a brief overview of the US FDA's history, structure, and responsibilities. As a note, the FDA has an agency-wide effort to be transparent and to promote innovation. And so, all of the information presented in this lecture are available on the FDA's website, and I highly recommend that you spend some time reviewing the resource links afterwards to learn more. So what does the FDA do? Since the Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA, is a regulatory agency under the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, its foremost mission is to enhance and protect the health and well-being of all Americans. How FDA achieves such a mission is by ensuring the safety, efficacy, and security of human and veterinary drugs, biological products, and medical devices and by ensuring the safety of the United States food supply, cosmetics, and products that emit radiation. The FDA also regulates tobacco products, advances product innovation, and plays a role in the United States counterterrorism capability by ensuring security of the food supply and fostering medical product development in response to emerging public health threats. The FDA didn't always have such a broad scope and the FDA's origin started back in 1848, when Louis Caleb Beck was appointed in the Patent Office to carry out chemical analyses of agricultural products. Later, this function was inherited by the Department of Agriculture in 1862, which was the beginning of the Bureau of Chemistry, the predecessor to the FDA. In 1883, Dr. Harvey Wiley, the father of the Pure Food and Drugs Act, became the chief chemist and expanded the food adulteration studies that began in 1880. He was instrumental in demonstrating the chemical preservatives as adulterants in the highly publicized Poison Squad experiments, in which able-bodied volunteers consumed varying amounts of questionable food additives to determine their impact on health. It wasn't until 1906 when the original Food and Drugs Act, or also known as the Wiley Act, was passed by Congress and signed by President Theodore Roosevelt that prohibited misbranded and adulterated foods, drinks, and drugs from interstate commerce. This was spurred by the shocking disclosures of insanitary conditions in meatpacking plants, as described in Upton Sinclair's book, The Jungle, and cure-all claims for worthless and dangerous medicines. While the Wiley Act focused on food as the greatest public health threat, over time, there was a need to change the law as there were shortcomings to the 1906 Wiley Act. This was exemplified when the FDA assembled a collection of products such as Banbar, a worthless cure for diabetes that the old law protected, Lash Lure, an eyelash dye in which a number of women suffered injuries to their eyes, including one confirmed case of permanent blindness, Radithor, a radium-containing tonic that sentenced users to a slow and painful death, and the Wild Height Exhaler, which falsely promised to cure tuberculosis and other pulmonary diseases. In 1937, the elixir sulfanilamide disaster accelerated the passing of the 1938 Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act as the untested liquid form of sulfanilamide killed over 100 people, many of whom were children. The public outcry from this incident not only reshaped the drug provisions of the new law to prevent such an event from happening again, but also propelled the bill itself through Congress. This new law brought cosmetics and medical devices under control, authorized factory inspections, corrected abuses in food packaging and quality, mandated pre-market approval for all new drugs, and required that drugs be labeled with adequate directions for safe use. In 1962, another therapeutic disaster arose. Thalidomide, a new sedative marketed as a sleeping pill for pregnant women, produced thousands of grossly deformed newborns in Western Europe. Having monitored the effects thalidomide had in Europe, Dr. Francis Kelsey, an FDA medical officer, decided to keep this drug off the US market and arouse public support for stronger drug regulations. As a result of this disaster, the key favor Harris drug amendments were passed to ensure drug efficacy and greater safety. For the first time, drug manufacturers were required to prove to the FDA that their products were not only safe, but also effective before being marketed. From 1962 to the present, 
Many other acts and amendments went into effect to further protect the public health, such as the Medical Device Amendments, which requires device manufacturers to register with the FDA and follow quality control procedures, and the Prescription User Fee Act, which requires drug and biologic manufacturers to pay fees for product applications. The history of the FDA is important for us to understand and appreciate as it shows how laws have evolved to continuously protect us from adulterated, misbranded, unsafe, and or ineffective products which can hurt the public's health. I talked about the history of the laws being passed that the FDA now enforces. What I would like to do now is to briefly describe the process of getting an idea into law. To get an idea such as to ensure drugs are safe and effective before being marketed into a law takes a legislative process starting from a bill. A bill is a draft legislation that may be introduced to a committee who may pass it on to Congress for review. For a national bill, when both the House of Representatives and the Senate approve the bill, it goes to the President who decides to either sign or veto the bill. When the bill is signed by the President, the bill is enacted into law and is called an act. The act is then interpreted by the regulatory agency responsible for enforcing the act to create regulations. Such regulations are to implement the act. The Code of Federal Regulations, also known as the CFR, is publicly available and can be found at ecfr.gov. To find the FDA regulations, go to Title 21, where you can browse the different parts. For this course, we will mostly be delving into Subchapter D, Drugs for Human Use, which can be found under Parts 300 to 499. However, there are other parts that pertain to drug development, such as Parts 50, 54, 56, 58, 200 to 299, and 600 to 680. Although the CFR provides the regulations, sometimes they are not as clear as we would like them to be. Therefore, the FDA provides guidance documents to provide their current thinking about certain regulations. For example, clinical trials being conducted under an IND require investigators to complete and sign the Statement of Investigator, also known as Form FDA 1572, or 1572 for short. While 21 CFR 312.53C1 states that the sponsor of the clinical trial needs to collect the 1572, the regulations does not specify if and when the 1572 needs to be submitted to the FDA. This is where the FDA provides a guidance document that helps sponsors understand more about the 1572 form and the FDA's expectations in regards to collection and submission of the 1572. So to summarize, an idea gets introduced to Congress as a bill, and if Congress approves a bill, it will go to the President to either sign or veto the bill. If the bill becomes law, it becomes an act, in which the regulatory agency responsible for overseeing it will create regulations to implement the act. And lastly, the regulatory agency, such as the FDA, can create guidance documents to provide their current thinking regarding certain regulations. Since developing a product such as a new drug requires tremendous teamwork, you may ask then, how does a drug developer communicate with the FDA? To answer this question, we need to understand the organizational structure of the FDA to properly communicate with them. The FDA consists of the Office of the Commissioner and four directorates overseeing the core functions of the agency, foods and veterinary medicine, global regulatory operations and policy, medical products and tobacco, and operations. For drug regulations, the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, also known as CBER, and the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, also known as CEDAR, are the primary centers that drug manufacturers will interact with during drug development. Under CEDAR, the Office of New Drugs has several offices that are broken further into divisions. These divisions are often a drug company's point of contact for drug development activities and each division specializes in a specific therapeutic area. In ODE1, we have DCARP, DNP, and DPP. As an example, these divisions are responsible for regulating drugs for the treatment of heart failure, Alzheimer's disease, and clinical depression, respectively. In ODE2, we have DAP, DMAP, and DPARP. These divisions regulate drugs such as for the treatment of pain, diabetes, and rheumatoid arthritis, respectively. 
in ODE3, we have DDP, DGIP, and DBRAP. These divisions regulate drugs such as for the treatment of psoriasis, ulcerative colitis, and osteoporosis, respectively. In ODE4, we have DMIP, DNDP, and DPMH. These divisions regulate drugs used in image-based diagnosis and monitoring, over-the-counter drugs, and facilitate quality initiatives for children and women of childbearing potential, respectively. In OHOP, we have DOP1, DOP2, DHP, and DHOT. These divisions regulate drugs for the treatment of various cancers, such as breast cancer, melanoma, and leukemia. It is important for a drug developer to understand the FDA's organizational structure to effectively partner with the FDA during drug development. Knowing which division to contact is one of the first steps to begin the drug development process. As I mentioned at the beginning, the FDA website has a lot of great information to guide drug developers and to inform the public about how to work with the FDA and what they do. So please take some time reading through the FDA website. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next lecture.